Hi, I'm Rusty Kamori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, are about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today is the anchor on KHON2 News and the owner of the very popular Coal Academy. She is Gina Mangieri, and today we are going beyond journalism. Hey, Gina, welcome to the show. Good morning, Rusty. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Gina, can you tell me about your background and where you grew up at? Sure. I grew up on the mainland in a small mountain town outside of Denver called Morrison, Colorado. And I was the daughter of a journalist, a newspaper woman, and of a builder, my dad. And after journalism, my mom went into her own uh, business, a retail store. My father had always sort of been in his own line of work, building different things around, around the, uh, the city there. And so I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family, my sister and I, my mom and I, my dad. So in one way, we always worked together and always contributed back to the family business in one way or another. And I think between those two things, between growing up with the, a journalist to influence me and also being in a family business where the work never ends, it seems I've carried that into my own life with my family these days. Well, you are definitely one of the highly respected journalists here in Hawaii. And I want to know, what is it about journalism that interested you in the beginning? Sure. Well, in the very beginning, I learned to read that way. That's how my mom would pull pages from the newspaper and, <laughs> and have us re learn to read that way. But also to have the discussions as a family about civics, about local government, about news and topics that we saw in the newspaper. You know, I can remember back in, oh gosh, you know, being a little, little kid in, in the 70s and <laughs> reading about Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan and <laughs> of that and we started growing up talking about national politics, local politics, but really as I pursued it as my own career too, um, and especially in the investigative journalism that I do, it's to be able to serve a, a community purpose, to be the fourth estate, to hold government accountable, um, to right wrongs, uh, to find where uh, wrongs, uh, you know, maybe be hiding or hiding in plain sight and to help give voice to the voiceless. So journalism has a, such an important role um, now more than ever in our communities locally and nationally. I totally agree. And Gina, you have a beautiful family, your husband and your two sons. How did you and your husband meet? <laughs> well, these days I can say we met the old fashioned way in a smoky bar. <laughs> He came up to talk to me in a bar in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. I worked at a newspaper down there. Gannett had a newspaper. I had been in Washington, D.C. Um, just prior to that. And they had a great little newspaper down in the, in the St. Thomas of all places that was doing pretty good investigative work. So I went down there um, as an editor and had real terrible hours. You know, you work from late afternoon to really late at night went to the local bar with, with uh, my colleague, one of the, the girls who edited with me and caught a drink and met my husband there. And he's a boat captain. And, um, you know, one thing leads to another. And we, a couple, you know, within a year or two, we're engaged and said, you know, where can we live that we both can have our careers? I had never really thought of myself as an island girl, certainly not an island that small for a long time. So we needed to find a place that was a big enough city for me um, and the kind where I could do the sort of journalism that I wanted to for the long haul and also a place that he could do his job, which is hospitality and ocean recreation. And so Honolulu was the perfect fit for us. Gina, he has a very successful boat business. Can you tell me about that? Sure. It's called Hawaii Nautical and it is in its 20th year this year. What a year to be turning 20. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's been um, it's been quite a ride. A uh, wonderful company, full of wonderful people of of, uh, of all different ages and talents, and um, uh, captains and crew and reservation experts and hospitality professionals. And it's ten boats across two islands, serving 
uh, all of Oahu and also Kona and the Kohala areas of the Big Island. Well, I love hearing that. And, and Gina, I love watching your always investigating segments. And I want to ask you, why do you think your segments are so popular among so many viewers in our community? Well, we really spend a lot of time. I, I get the good fortune of of a long time on in TV time, so to speak. So my, my stories tend to be two or even three times longer than the average TV story might be. So I've always thought of myself as, as a newspaper girl, even though I've been with KHON for almost 18 years now, I still think of myself as, as the newspaper girl I was back in the beginning of my career. And so I like to write, I like to investigate, I like to dig and research a lot. So I think one of the big reasons is there's a lot of information in there. There's a lot of detail um, and scope and context that we have the time to give. Um, and also we ask the questions I think that the, the people want asked. Not, no magic formula there. I'm no, you know, not, nothing that takes, takes any kind of, of uh, mystery formula, but it's the kind of things you might shout at your own television if you were wanting to know why in the world is that happening that way? Or how, how could that be? And simply being able to ask the people, having the access to ask the people in power, why is this so and what can you do about it? And I've always tried to be tough, certainly, but fair and kind, you know, and it's not that when, when you're doing investigative journalism, you don't have to be uh, mean or harsh about it. You can ask tough questions in a very respectful way because we're both going for the same thing. Even if someone has done something supposedly wrong or if there could be a better way. Generally, it's well-meaning people, even, you know, even, even, uh, even when they, they might not be doing, making the best choices. And together we can get to a better result. And so I've always tried to hold that respect as well. Even when the might seem like a confrontational topic, no reason to be confrontational in the, in the interview process. Well, you're right. I, I do like it when you ask those tough questions, and I'm sure they don't like it. But uh, Gina, I want to know, uh, of the thousands of stories that you've covered, what's one of the most meaningful, impactful stories that, that really sticks out to you? You know, this whole year of covering COVID, it's hard to get that topic in general off of my mind. I would have to say that this year wins out among anything else, um, because we, there's so much information, so much potential for misinformation, and so many times where we have to really read between the lines, to borrow a phrase from you know the title of your book, to say, what? Well, okay, what? What is that? There's a spike in numbers. Okay, but what does that mean? And and like take our most recent spike, for instance, big big numbers in the summer, but thankfully most of them, the majority of them were younger, generally healthier, and generally recovered much more quickly. Now it's hard to see that when the big, you know, some of the, the more tragic news can grab the headlines and is still very important, the tragic deaths that mount at a, a nursing home, for example. But that has to be balanced with looking at the, what the reality is as well, in terms of for the vast majority of people, they're going to be okay. And for the small minority of people, they're going to be very, very sick and we need to help those people while still freeing up our economy to safely handle the rest of us who, who may generally come through it in the end. And so how do you balance that without falling into that political shout match dialogue you can see so easily on Facebook, right? Oh, it's just the flu. No, it's not just the flu. It's worse than that. But by the same token, we can live with it. And so I think trying every day to tiptoe that line down the middle to say it's a little bit of both and how to safely get through that. I think that's how I can continue to be the most impactful um, through this pandemic is communicating clearly and concisely. Well, you are fantastic, Gina. And you and my buddy, uh, Justin Cruz, I mean, you guys are very popular, super terrific on the news anchor desk together. Why do you guys make such a great team? 
you know, I, Justin has been part of my life in one way or another for more than 20 years. Back when I first came to Hawaii, I was the, the editor at Pacific Business News, and he was in the same building as I was down when he was at the radio station. So we were elevator buddies. I'd see him on the way to get a snack downstairs and just always thought the world of him, you know, who, do, who wouldn't? Um, he's a kind, thoughtful, smart person. Um, who's just a joy to be around as a person. And as I got to know him more when he came to Channel 2, I saw we've kind of lived parallel lives. You know, you know, he's kind of my brother from another mother in a way, you know, growing up in a small, hardworking family business. Um, you know, we're, we're about the same age. We sort of grew up in sort of the same everything from the music we grew up with to our experiences with family businesses. Um, even we'll find these funny intersections in, in our lives sometimes. Turns out he was in the musical Annie in high school and so was I. So I, I rib him that sometimes we're going to have to reprise our roles from our, from our illustrious musical careers. So even to this day, I continue to be surprised how much overlap we have in our lives. And I think we just sync up really well there. And we both fundamentally, I think, have the same belief in serving our community and informing people clearly and concisely, even on really scary things. And he's the master of that, right? Hurricanes, you know, he's the guy you want to watch. He's going to tell you what's happening, not scare you, not sensationalize it. No, nothing about ratings there. Just give you the information you need to know straightforward. No, I like, I like hearing that Gina and I want to know if you really look deeply, um, you know, into yourself, why do you think you're such a successful um, journalist and TV anchor? Oh, gosh, I don't know about the TV part. I've always wondered that myself, too, because, again, as I said, I'm just I'm just a newspaper girl in a TV world, so I can't explain the television part. But I think from journalism, you know, it, it really is um, journalism for journalism's sake. You know, I, I never... Uh, wanted to be in TV to be an anchor. I uh, it wasn't about, um, you know, image or being on TV or that or that for me. This just happens to be one of the mediums that I've been able to practice my craft in. And these days, of course, online too. I, we could still write a lot, type up a lot of longer pieces that we put up on air too. So the television part, I think, is, you know, this just happens to be the way that we are communicating right now. But the journalism part at its core, it's how can I best amass a whole lot of information, simplify it as much as possible for the broader community and, and get the questions answered. Um, and most importantly, get access to the people who need to be the ones answering those questions and solve some problems. So I, I think it's that that part of it. It's it's doing the job of journalism with the end result in mind. What's the problem? How am I going to fix it? And who do I need to reach to hold them accountable to do that? That makes sense. And, and Gina, it seems like you guys have such a great culture of excellence among your coworkers at KHON2. Well, why is that? I think we really are working for Hawaii. That's, you know, a tagline, but it's, it's not. It was crafted from us from ourselves, from talking together, not handed to us from a consultant, you know, or that it's, I can remember over the years that really developing and say, well, what do we do? Well, we, we get up every morning and we, we work for you, for our community. What does our community need to know to keep, especially these days, to keep you and your family safe? Um, we've had so many just crazy things, if you think over the years, lava flows and rain bombs on Kauai and hurricanes and pandemics. I mean, just take the natural disasters alone. Um, that takes a whole community to stay in touch about how we can best keep each other safe. And then you think of the really big issues in our community, whether it's, you know, rail uh, here on, on Oahu or issues with, with how and when the neighbor islands are going to be more open to tourism safely in the face of a pandemic that largely has avoided them, thank goodness. Um, you know, so I think when you look at what we do, we think about that every day as a team and then we just all jump in. There's, you know, we have, of course, as every business does, you have meetings in the morning about who's going to do what. But throughout the day, it's just constant communication. Oh, I can do that. I can grab that. Hey, did you hear this? Oh, I hear you're working on a story about that. Uh, here's, a, here's a phone number. Everybody's always throwing stuff in the stew together. Um, 
and everyone really does jump in when they're needed too. So I think that culture is, it's never just a one and done for us as a team. It's constantly contributing um, and weighing in with each other about how we can do it better day to day. Well, and Gina, you, as you know, you know, I talk about, you know, creating that superior culture of excellence in my books. And I know you have my books and I want to know what principles stood out to you in my books? Well, one of the things I think that jumped out to me immediately is your four P's. I have four P's as well in our business. They're different, but but I could see where they really align. And when I read that in your book, Beyond the, in Beyond the Lines, I thought, you know, that that is, isn't that something, you know, for you, it's, it's the people, the purpose, the process, the performance, they just had an aha moment for myself reading that. In ours, in our business, we weigh, weigh everything on the four P's of people. We started with people as well. Partners. Also, if you think of, especially though this is real business oriented, right? Of course. So your bankers, your lawyers, your regulators, your licensors, um, prosperity. Okay. I used to, when we first started out thinking that third P was, was profit, but that was too narrow. Profit might be good for me, but come at the expense of my people. They need to be prosperous. So we changed profit pretty early on to the concept of prosperity. Of course, the business needs to make money, but so do the people. That's why we pay our minimum wage is far above a minimum wage. It's the living wage or above, right? There has to be prosperity. And finally, perpetuity. Can we do this for the long haul forever or what forever, whatever forever means, right? So in the ocean activity business, it's we don't swim with dolphins. We don't swim with manta rays. We don't, you know, use plastics and things that can pollute because that's not sustainable. That's can't, we can't have perpetuity doing that. Might be able to make a lot of money, but it can't be done forever. Um, you know, and same thing in in for the preschools. Per, uh, perpetuity might mean something different. Over the years, there it's been you know making sure we look at the kinds of locations and the kinds of whether it's the physical structures, the security. Certainly these days, the precautions against pandemics and what the future might bring for us there to say, how can this keep going safely for the long haul? So those are our four Ps. I think that really synced up to me and I loved reading yours. And now I have eight Ps. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gina, I love your four Ps there and uh, I, it, it makes sense. And you know, you're a very successful business entrepreneur. I want to know why, why did you start the Coal Academy? Sure. Well, my husband and I are stay at work parents. <laughs> you know, you see, you, I'm, I'm, I, I, I always wish I, I could be a stay at home mom. We just never had that, that luxury. And so as stay at work parents, we needed to have a way when our first son, Cole, was coming along, um, now almost 18 years ago, oh, he's almost off to college. And we said, you know, as stay at work parents, what do we want in early childhood education and in, in infant care, most importantly, I only had six weeks of maternity leave back from the newspaper back in the day. And there, at that time, there wasn't a lot of options for center-based uh, downtown specifically, um, infant care that worked the hours that we needed to work. And so we started it. So we started the Cole Academy downtown so that working moms and dads, grandparents and, and aunties and uncles for that matter, could have a place where they could safely rely on us from bell to bell all day long, all year long too. So you'll only see us closed on the big holidays when, you know, when the workers also have off, maybe a 4th of July or Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Um, but we don't disappear for a summer break or a spring break or fall. We're there when parents need to work. So the first campus opened downtown and then five more over the years uh, through the different communities and into the, into the suburban communities and even one off island on the big island. Well, wow, it's such a, it, I find it so interesting how, you know, you, you had that idea, you had that need, you know, for yourself and you thought, you know what, I, I might as well just open up my own, my own place and, and wow, to have six now to expand it to six, you know, like you said, five on Oahu, one on the big island. What do you think are the reasons for its success? The people. 
my number one P, the people for sure, and their consistency and their excellence at what they do day in and day out. We were so fortunate from the beginning to have, and to this day, she's still with us as our CEO, um, Emily Awaya Leong. And when we were first forming the Cole Academy, we knew what we needed as parents, and we knew we could handle the concept as a business in terms of finding a location, dealing with leasing, getting loans, those kind of things. That was our area of expertise, but we weren't educators, and we needed to bring on the experts to turn that part of it over to and truly did and from day one and to this day emily our ceo who has that background and that education and she she ran large center-based care on the mainland before coming back home to hawaii she's a hawaii girl born and raised and moved back home to hawaii with her husband just as we were forming the coal academy and you can see us sort of in parallel us thinking okay we want this formal, high-end, center-based, safe, you know, bell to bell, <laughs> downtown oriented center, but it hadn't been done before. And Emily coming back from, from in her case, Portland, Oregon, running large centers there, her probably saying the same thing. Look at my skills. What am I going to do here? It doesn't exist here. So it was the perfect timing and the perfect marriage where she could continue what she was doing and bring that level of expertise to Hawaii and grow it from there. So she's just amazing and can, has, has formed that education team, which you know, grew at this point you know, into six directors of campuses. You picture they call it a principal of a, of a preschool is essentially called is a director. And then they hire all of their caregivers and their teachers from there. So it is, it is those people, those dedicated early childhood education professionals. They're not babysitters, they're teachers, they're caregivers, and they take that to heart. And boy, have we seen that in the pandemic, what excellence can really do. We never shut down, we couldn't. We're among the most essential of the businesses. How can the doctors and the grocers and the EMS workers, you know, and, and, and the nursing home workers for that matter, get to where they need to be if we weren't there? And Emily and her team kept it going without missing a beat safely um, and is just an astounding example of what can be done. Well, you're so right, Gina, about, you know, it's about the people and, and really having great leadership. And what do, you, what do you feel the best leaders do? I think they are servant leaders. Um, they lead from, from behind. They encourage their people to find their passion to work in their passion um, and to find that purpose, you know, every day and, and to fuel that for, for the people. And I, something really jumped out at me from your book when you talk about discipline, not being disciplinary, it's not punishment, it's repetition, it's, it's, uh, it's perfecting what you do to, to the extent that perfection can always be out there on the horizon, right? But it is, it is the discipline to continue to do every single day uh, what you do. Um, and again, there's no, you know, we talked about this with the, with the television, even with the television formula too, there's no secret sauce to what we're doing. There's no magic formula. Our competition can see every day what we do. So when, when what you do is not top secret, <laughs> the only way you can succeed relative to the competition is to just do it better and more consistently. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, when you're successful, you already created a, you know, kind of like a model of, of you know, of success for others to follow. Gina, I want to ask you, you know, personally or professionally, what's a big adversity or a challenge that you dealt with that you overcame? It would again have to be this whole year of 2020. I think this is going to be and has been for all of us. Uh, where were you when it happened moment, you know, and the last ones before that for our economy being sort of the 9-11 moments, you know, so certainly this year has been the most adversity um, that we've ever faced as business owners, as parents of kids in the other room doing their, their online schooling. Um, it's, it's one challenge after another. Um, and one opportunity after another to just continue to test your resilience. And just when you think you're tired from your ultra marathon, you know, you've got another uh, 26 miles ahead of you for another lap, just pick it up and do it again. So I think this COVID has tested all of us past the point, past the breaking point. If you had asked in March, um, 
would you be still, you know, running at full speed? Could you be? I, I think I probably would have said, no, there's no way. There's no way I can make it to September. Um, especially when you look at the boat businesses, we were shut down for months, open for a sliver of time, shut down again. If you had told us in March, you're not going to really be in business till probably October, it would have been a, you know, soul crushing moment. I think none of us believed back then it would go on so long and it has. So you just, you keep on going. I, I you know, it'll be a, in retrospect that we all learn really how we did keep going. Um, but it's a matter of continuing to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, take help when it's offered. We've never been ones to reach out for help or ask for a dime that we didn't deserve. But, you know, in these days when, when the, the rescue loans, the, whether it's the payroll protection loans or some small grants along the way happened, that's been helpful for many small businesses, including ours. Um, but again, it's, it's those people being able to go to work every single day. Let's take, for example, the, the, the news station or the, at the preschools, people, essential workers in both cases, just get up every day, do your job as safely as you possibly can. Of course, personal safety, number one. And then for those who had to be shut down by order of the government on the vote business, hang in there. Oh my gosh, how? When am I ever gonna be able to give back to my career? They're asking, will I ever sail again? Um, and keeping keeping the um, momentum up there somehow, despite the shutdown, keep that sense of Ohana and teamwork. It's been a challenge, we've managed to do it. The team is still intact to this day, despite being shut down in March in the hospitality business. It's re remarkable to me that they've all hung in there. Well, you know, you're right. We learn a lot about ourselves during adversity, you know, because when we get through it, when we deal with it and get through it, we become better people for going through that experience. And, you know, it's, it's a mindset. It's, it's having the right perspective and it's having, you know, a choice that we all have, you know, that power to choose what we want to, you know, how we want to achieve what we want to achieve. Uh, Gina, I want to ask you one more question uh, before we wrap up. What, what gives you fulfillment? The success of our people with the businesses gives, gives me great fulfillment. The, excess of, the success of my people, my family people, <laughs> gives me tremendous fulfillment. Um, to see you know, my husband enjoying what he's doing, to see my kids grow into their own individual young men with just amazing interests and pursuits that I could have never imagined for either of them. Um, and to see them becoming their own, their own young adults, um, ha, is, gives me tremendous joy and excitement. I, my oldest is, you know, will be going off to college this time next year, and it's, I feel like I'm applying for college again, you know, with him. It's such a joy, and and my younger one is just continues to astound us all with his creativity as a little artist and um, just an amazing a person to be around, as as is the older brother with his. So, you know. I could go on and on, of course, as anyone could about their own kids, but just as I take great joy in them finding their way and finding their person, um, I really do think that about all 250 of our employees across both family companies. They tend to be, the older I get, the younger they seem, <laughs> but they tend to be young, younger people generally who are, you know, the world is their oyster. And I, I'm so sad that they've had to go through what they had to go through early in their careers um, with this COVID thing. But my husband and I can give them a, a few pearls of wisdom. You know, we, we did survive as a business through 9-11, through the 2008 and 9 crashes um, and little bumps and bruises along the way with the economy. And, and we have told them from the beginning, it's going to be okay. You're going to get there. Okay, keep doing what you're doing and we'll be here. And you know, we may cry ourselves to sleep at night wondering how we're gonna be there, but they don't have to see that part. Um, we're gonna get them through somehow. And it, it brings me great pride and tremendous personal happiness um, when they succeed. Well, Gina, you know, it's been fantastic having you on the show today. I mean, you're making such a great impact in our community in more ways than one. And really wanna thank you for taking time to be on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Gina and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.